We have had a terrific morning. Really lots of uh, you are thinking about what uh, comments uh, Peter made and the general made and so forth. And uh, um, so hopefully, you know, please start thinking about your uh, questions. I'm going to start with the question. Uh, I will start with you, Peter. <laughs> okay. uh, um, Generally, industrial companies, you know, they are hesitant to deploy newer technologies in their plants. They want you know, their competition to first, you know, test those technologies and yeah. prove those technologies and so forth. Uh, you know, Dow, you being the leader, you generally, you know, are a little faster than other companies adopting technologies. Do you have a process? that you use to bring new technologies into your plants, uh, or uh, what do you yeah. try to do before you bring them into your plants? Appreciate that. The, I think at Dow, uh, as I spoke earlier, we have an addiction to technology. Most of my executive colleagues, they have uh, a technical background, uh, so we are constantly questioning what is new when we go and visit our factories. That's, that's what we want to know. What are the new things out there? What can be done? But then we also uh, analyze, and I like very much uh, what uh, Greg Tovel was saying, you have to manage risk and you have to mitigate risk. So when you look at new technology, if that is really impacting the broad base of your activity, you want to make sure you have a lot of testing, beta testing, you have a lot of simulation. If it is something uh, that is more special uh, that is um, that is contained we are willing to make uh, bigger we are willing to take bigger risks and, and try it but in all cases we want to preserve <coughs> the safety of our operations the communities the neighbors <coughs> and our people so we don't want to take any risks there but you have to give uh, technology a chance and as i said uh, if you don't ch change you will be changed uh, Chet, uh, at the end over there, you know, what, what does Yokogawa do help your customers, you know, bring newer technologies into their operations? Um, that's a, a good question. Uh, traditionally, uh, we used to go out and pull the customers, get the voice of the customer, and try to understand what some of their problems are and see if we could come up with a solution. But what we're looking at right now is how to bring innovation uh, a lot closer to solving some of these problems that people may not even know they have. So what we're doing at this point in time is trying to engage with our strategic customer relationships on basically experimenting with perhaps trying to solve some of their very difficult problems and their involvement in that uh, experimentation and learning more about what could be the final eventual solution, and what are, as Peter mentioned, the risks in adopting that technology. Peter Herbert, would you like to comment? Uh, sure, sure. You know, I think there is the whole bandwidth of very conservative customers to customers that uh, want to try out new things. And um, from, from our experience, you don't want to go to a customer that is very conservative and trying to uh, explore the latest and greatest technology with him. So you need to find the customers who, you know, like, like Peter mentioned, uh, you know, let's engage into some of the technology, both knowing what's going to be in front of us, and then move this ahead. So that's, that's one aspect. The second aspect that I mentioned earlier in, in my speech, we have 270 factories, and um, 50 of those are under my responsibility. So if we are bringing out new stuff, um, you know, there is plenty of opportunity to check it out in our own facilities. And um, that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do and um, demonstrate it to the customer. General, from cybersecurity perspective, you know, all these companies out there, you know, have new solutions and so forth. Uh, you know, uh, do you have any advice for companies? How should they bring new cybersecurity solutions into their plants? Well, I, I, uh, I was very impressed with Peter's uh, comments here. You know, within the uh, software business, uh, there's the phrase eating your own dog food. Uh, and uh, basically going out and uh, making sure that you test uh, your own products on yourself before you uh, take them to market. 
I think that's a, 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 an excellent uh, way to do things. And it also produces better products, better confidence in it, and it also produces a uh, better uh, support structure for your clients as, uh, as your, client, uh, as your uh, staff becomes more familiar with the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the products. Uh, as we take a look at cybersecurity, baking it in, as, uh, as it were, making sure that that's part of the product itself, I think, is now a business imperative, and it gives uh, folks a, a, a competitive advantage in the marketplace where you're producing products that have security already built in. And uh, I think that as uh, producers of industrial control systems and other products uh, go out there and into the marketplace, they certainly should be looking at cybersecurity as a feature that's uh, part of the product set itself. And uh, failure to incorporate cybersecurity will be seen as a weakness in the marketplace if it isn't already. Excellent. Uh, could we have a show of hands with questions, please? Okay, do you have a question? Okay, Ole, please identify yourself uh, uh, if you could, yeah. Yeah, Lee Richards uh, owns Corning. Um, our mascot is the Pink Panther, so this, uh, <laughs> this question is to Peter Holicki. Uh, it's interesting to me that uh, the elephant is in the land of uh, the mouse today uh, with Orlando and Disney. Mm. Um, and you know, legend has it that elephants are afraid of mice. And it's actually been proven by Mythbusters that they are a little bit spooked by mice. So my question to you is, what are your mice? Uh, what are the top three mice that you are worried about, afraid of uh, at Dow? Uh, more from a business perspective than, than a technology perspective. Thank you. I think uh, the mice are often uh, bigger than you think, and that's probably why the elephant is afraid. Uh, Andy uh, showed the picture here about the recent uh, economic developments that we are all exposed to. Uh, so if you have um, a big technology revolution going on in your company that tends to stretch over multiple years, you have to be really resilient and you have to, like the general said, really good recovery plans and mitigation plans in place if something happens in that multi-year execution of your technology plan change, or in our case, when you build a big factory like Sedara. So you want to have a good backup uh, for those situations. Another element is that uh, is uh, when I speak about security and cybersecurity, the other reality is also that we have external attacks, but we also need to understand that most attacks most leakage is coming from sources from within. So we have to uh, stay very close to our people. We have to understand what they do. We have to foster them. And we have to understand what, what's driving them. And so uh, we make sure there's not a, a bad apple in the basket. Uh, the, uh, the, the third thing is, when I spoke earlier, it is about... Uh, where is the trend set? What is the benchmark out there? And that we are meeting or exceeding that benchmark. And at times, you have disruptive uh, technologies out there. Our industry has that seen a few times where, where people uh, were building in conventional technology for a long time, and suddenly new technology came in. You had not on your radar screen, and uh, your competitive edge is wiped out. So this is some of the mice. Uh, and I'm worried. Yeah. So that's why the elephant has a trunk always down to, to snoop uh, what's taking place on the floor. Excellent. Uh, I, would you like to comment uh, <laughs> over there? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll yeah. jump into yeah. this. I'll, yeah. I'll land on that grenade. A uh, couple of things. Uh, for, from my perspective uh, at, uh, in the federal government, there's, uh, there's so many different risks that are out there. Uh, things keep me up at night. Uh, one is a major attack on the financial system that uh, disrupts uh, trust and confidence in our ability to, uh, to manage our finances. Uh, you know, it's a global, international uh, financial system. It's all reliant on information technology. We work very closely with the financial sector. Uh, they are top notch, uh, but it, we are constantly working to maintain the integrity of our financial systems. 
Uh, two, uh, the energy sector is uh, critically important as well. When the lights go out, people get uh, frightened. Uh, industry slows down or stops. Uh, the vast majority of businesses don't have their own independent generators and electrical production. So it's incumbent upon us as a society to protect those, uh, those assets. Uh, third uh, would be uh, health care. Uh, it's increasingly important to make sure that uh, our health care industry and uh, the, the product sets that are out there are safe and secure. Nobody wants to have somebody you know, hacking into a pacemaker like on the TV show Homeland. You want to make sure that the, the devices are safe and secure, the patient's records are uh, safe and secure and protected from in inadvertent disclosure and the like. Those are uh, top three for me. Sure, sure. Um, what kept, keeps me up at night is how can we support our customers in, in order to keep their plans or their operations se secure. As I said earlier, the, I think the internet is within, within the factories or within the plans for a very long time. I'm not talking about the office, I'm talking about the, the, the shop floor. So um, it goes back what uh, Gregory said earlier a little bit. I couldn't remember all five points. I, I just, um, we just basically talk about three. The, um, but the first one being the same, that's um, going jointly into an assessment of, um, of saying, you know, where, uh, where is uh, risk exposure? And then as a second step, come up with a planning of a comprehensive system to secure the plant. The, uh, you, you need, of course, um, uh, operations as well as IT at, um, uh, at the customer. And then is the, the continuous um, security monitoring and updating of the, of the equipment. And for that, we've um, at, uh, at Siemens, and I'm, I'm not trying to use the abbreviations, but I need to, I need to cheat a little bit. We've set up the Siemens Cybersecurity uh, Operations Center, which is in connection with entities like, like yours to see where is malware out there that potentially um, could harm some of our customers. If we find it out, we check it out on our own in our own laboratories and then go out and advise our customers uh, as quickly as possible uh, to, to secure their operations. Is it always working? Um, no, but um, I would uh, fully underline what you said earlier. It's about risk management. Understand where's the risk and where one can live with a certain risk and where it's mission critical, where are mission critical assets that need to be protected. I mean, early on in my career, I was living uh, four years in the UK and that's uh, obviously one of the oldest monarchies. And one thing I learned there, when you have crown jewels, which they have, yeah. most of the time, almost all of the time, they are under lock and key. They are only shown around at very decisive moments. So if you have identified something as a crown jewel, you also need to be comfortable to have it locked away most of the time. Otherwise, it's not fitting the definition of a crown jewel. Excellent. Um, let's. And any other question? Okay. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Bill Lydon, editor, Automation.com and Intech Magazine. It's for Peter from Dow. Uh, with the new systems you described, how close to real-time visibility do you have to the lowest level of your manufacturing now? So, the question is. Uh, can you repeat that? Well, typically, when an ERP environment, you really didn't have immediate real-time information, visibility at the lowest level you're manufacturing. In this new system you described, how far down, how, what kind of real-time visibility do you have to, to how, how low a level in your manufacturing now? I think uh, with the new system we have, uh, there's so much potential to really get to what you are saying. I would say today uh, we, we have uh, daily visibility on, on the production we have anywhere in the world. We have uh, obviously an understanding of one of the, the units is troubled, so it's all coming together. But what I also said, the constant issue is to, to whistle the data, to prepare it well, and really only flush those data up that needs to be decision taking on. So don't get addicted to the data and you don't get swamped to it. But the new system has the capability to be as real time as you want. And more importantly also, to share that with the customer. I think this is an, 
something our industry has to learn from many of the companies here. We are today not selling any more products, just chemicals. We are also selling uh, services, and in some cases, our customer they want to have solutions provided by us that might include delivering plants or certain technical solutions they don't want to develop themselves. So, uh, but the system is a is a big thing. Yes. And any other question here? Uh, do we have? Okay, go, go ahead. Uh, please Hello. identify yourself. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm Rajiv from Siemens. The question is to Peter Holiki from yes. Dow, related to cyber topic. Uh, we've been speaking, I mean, I've been hearing about risk on the context of embracing technology, and we also hear the same risk on the topic about risk management as a topic about cyber. Now, in Dow, do you have a common currency to measure? either of these risks so that you can prioritize your investments with regard to embracing technology and the other side is to, you know, know your goalposts kind of stuff with cyber. So do you have a common framework where you have a common metric for evaluating yeah. these both kind of risks? I think in recent, first of all, I like very much what Greg spoke about, the necessity that cybersecurity has to be truly lifted from the realms of expert into uh, broad understanding and, and broad management of it. Already for a number of years, uh, cybersecurity is a boardroom discussion, and we have willfully moved together the security aspects on the IT side with the security aspects of operations and, and R&D. And uh, everything uh, we heard earlier from Greg, we are also doing very well. We try to understand what is it we need protecting, what is it, um, how do we monitor intruders? Uh, but then there's also things uh, when it comes to the core of the safety of our facilities, we make sure that those systems run completely independent of the internet and of the world outside. So if there's an intrusion, that will not, that, that will not hit that element because this is something we own or we owe to the communities and the people working in there. But uh, yeah, in the last years, the, the, the IT and the operations world has come together, forced sometimes to the security issues. Excellent. Um, over there, do we have any questions over there? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, way, way over there. Yeah, let's just move over there. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my question is less about cybersecurity and more about the asset and the plant management. And, and so this is kind of a general question for everybody. One of the things that we have found is given the automation that we've got and the, and the information systems we've got, we have tons and tons and tons of data. Our painful point tends not to be the collection of data. Where do we get it? It's where do we find the time and the talent to analyze that data to turn it into something useful? And so I'm kind of curious about how you've approached that in the different places that you work uh, and, and any ideas on how to best solve that problem. Thank you. Let me see maybe. Uh, Jeff, do you want to start over there? Uh, I, I guess the question was how do I handle all the data, both structured, unstructured, all over your operations from uh, the feed all the way through to producing the product, whatever that may be. And it is the issue that I think the Internet of Things is trying to address. And it's a whole new area of activity around data sciences and uh, the mathematics involved in how do we extract information and useful information from all of that data. So as far as uh, in Yokogawa now, we see that uh, bringing on board the kind of competency that is basically mathematicians. If, if uh, I was advising somebody to, that's going to college today, I'd say get a degree in mathematics, <coughs> study data sciences, because you're going to have a very big job to do and you'll always be needed. So I think that's part of the solution, but it's going to take some time. There are some already available algorithms or algorithmic mathematics that can solve some of these problems today, but there's a lot more research and development needed in this area. Yeah, sure. The, uh, I think it's an extremely valid point uh, that, that you're bringing up. Um, when 
everybody talks about uh, big data and uh, not adding a domain expertise to it. So somebody who really understands how, run, how the plant is running and what's the data uh, that, um, that I really want. Because the danger is you have so much data um, and you analyze it and analyze it to you know, find out something that you could have found out by just you know, looking at this one data point uh, that has been programmed by the commissioning engineer of the, uh, of the plant. So the experience that we've made is it is important that we bring people who understand the, um, um, have domain expertise of the plant, so whatever you're doing, people who have done the installation and um, you know, then sit together and figure out whether there is additional information you want to have that you cannot get today or that you're not unable to get today. I'm sure you can, you know, if you, if you hire somebody who's a data miner, he can find out everything for you, but most of the stuff is probably available already today in the control system. So from, from that perspective, uh, I, I think it, it requires the, your engineers, our engineers, and um, maybe one or the other small tool to make some of that uh, information available for you. That'd be my recommendation. Rick, Rick do you have? Something? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on this one as well. You know, um, I, I'd like to echo what uh, Chet and uh, Peter said. You know, data scientists is an emerging field, and uh, the the utility of somebody who has that skill set uh, is invaluable in any different industry uh, or activity that's out there. Um, you know, we're, frankly, we in the Department of Homeland Security, we're hiring data scientists to work uh, for my organization because one of the things I want to do is this, instead of getting to be more reactionary, I, I like to use predictive analytics and behavioral activities to detect the bad guys and their behaviors and head them off at the pass before they can go in and, and get to our crown jewels. And I need somebody with the skill set of a data scientist to uh, help me get there. So we're in the process of onboarding data scientists and recruiting through the universities to get that skill set. Uh, but, you know, government and manufacturing aren't the only folks that are doing this. You know, I just bring your attention to the, uh, the since it's two weeks from spring training, you know, take a look at Moneyball, you know, and sabermetrics with uh, baseball. Even baseball is relying on the big data and the data analytics that are out there. And, uh, as we take a look at every business, every critical uh, sector out there, there's a case to be made that uh, everybody should be looking at how to leverage data scientists, big data, and uh, the analytics that go with it to improve their operations, to identify where vulnerabilities are, and then to help best posture for success. I'd like to make one comment on that as well. I think we have to be very careful that we don't uh, turn the world upside down. The data itself should not necessarily drive something. Uh, so we need to be clear what we want to accomplish and then use the data to, to, to get it done. To uh, give you an example, uh, 10 years ago in Dow, uh, our crackers, that's one of the big installations we have in the petrochemical industry, they had to have a turnaround every five years. And we decided we want to extend the period between turnarounds. And we use data, we use predictive tools, we use uh, equipment reliability strategies to get there. Today, we are running eight years between turnarounds throughout the fleet. And in fact, uh, we have one cracker in Tunisia that will only have an outage after nine years. And in those nine years, that cracker only missed a single day of production. So if you are clear of what you want to accomplish, then look at your data. But if you have people come and uh, confuse you with the hell of amount of data they have, that might not be the wise thing for you to, yeah. to look at. Excellent point. Excellent. Um, I thought we had, there was a question over here someplace. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. 
So my name is Scott Abramson. Um, I'm in the utility business, and this question is directed to Greg. And so, Greg, you had mentioned that uh, in cybersecurity we need to identify, protect, detect, uh, respond, respond and, recover. and recover. Thank you for adding those. And so you also mentioned some key areas, the financial markets, and then the energy sector. So the landscape of the energy sector is changing. You know, traditionally you had plants that were confined to one area or one footprint, and then the utility operator owners can look after that. But today you have wind farms, solar farms, mm -hmm. these renewable assets that are all over the country and essentially exposed to cyber attacks. How do you see the Department of Homeland Security interjecting themselves to help facilitate cybersecurity for that? Well, thanks for that question. You know, frankly, we, uh, we very closely work with the Department of Energy. And, uh, you know, for example, I've been on speed dial uh, Assistant Secretary Pat Hoffman and her uh, deputy Mike Smith over there, my counterparts in the Department of Energy. And then further, we work with what's called the Energy Sector Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or ISAC, which uh, represents the uh, commercial sector partners in the energy community. Uh, we work um, with a, a regular series of engagements with them to make sure that we are sharing best practices because I would submit that compliance alone doesn't get you the best results, but best practices will get you compliance and a whole lot more. So we are working to share information with the energy sector on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, Tim Roxy, who is our representative from the energy sector, has a presence out on the NKIC floor so that uh, as stuff is coming into us, into the, the federal government, we have representatives from the energy sector that, uh, that are, are there to get that information as well. So from a cyber neighborhood watch standpoint, they're there in our control center to help share information. Further, you know, we're working through our industrial control systems uh, CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team. Uh, we partnered with DOE and others, and in <coughs> fact, my ICS CERT is headquartered at the Idaho National Labs up in Idaho Falls, which is a Department of Energy facility. And we're constantly working with the department and with the, uh, the energy sector to develop, uh, to develop new tactics, techniques, and procedures for hardening the systems that are already out there to help build in new capacity and new capabilities for emerging systems and to uh, uh, partner so that there's no surprises. Excellent. Okay, do we have a question uh, out there? Ah, okay, over there, yeah. Uh, Ed Crawford, Chevron. Uh, this is for General Tallhill. Uh, the uh, new technologies we're talking about, and, uh, and we all embrace those, that we have to have it for uh, final solutions, but uh, there's, there's not one new technology that our, that our suppliers are going to supply to us. Maybe they will supply a new technology, but it's layered on many, many, many other uh, foundational technologies. Uh, is your operations cybersecurity center focused on those fundamental underlying technologies and where there might be vulnerabilities associated with the functionality we really want? Uh, virtualization pops to mind, but I'm thinking going forward, you have a plan for someone saying, hey, "I want to give you this new vulnerable, a new uh, uh, excuse me functionality," uh, and I'm not sure if I have vulnerabilities that will be associated with that. Is there a roadmap going forward for new technologies? Yeah, well, I, I thank you for the uh, question. I, I got a couple of things out of what you said. First of all, um, from a doctrinal approach, we take a defense in depth strategy. And uh, I think that's prudent for everybody, you know. Uh, and and if, to use the analogy of a bank, you know, when, when I take a look at the safeguarding of my money in a bank, you know, I've got the image of the big bank vault that's in the center of the bank, and it's got the big door and the like. But I also have the tellers that's the next line out there, you know, with the, the big wall in front of me and the, the vault. And oh, by the way, the vault's closed and locked, except for when it needs to be opened. Um, often banks will have security guards that are out there. They'll also have alarm systems, and then they have a trained workforce. 
So I've just mentioned five layers of defense just with the, you know, the local bank analogy. I think as you take a look at uh, your information, you need to have that defense in depth uh, strategy. You need to have a trained workforce. You need to have the right technology. You have to have the right understanding of what you have. As, as Peter here said, you, you protect the crown jewels. Um, so technology alone is not going to solve all your problems. And if any salesman shows up on your doorstep and says, hey, I've got the perfect technology that's going to make you bulletproof when it comes to cybersecurity and protecting your information, the alarm bell should be going off in your mind. And you probably don't you're, you're going to want to do a whole lot of investigation on this individual. Uh, frankly, I would probably hear them politely and then show them the door. Defense in depth should be part of your uh, strategy for not only cybersecurity, but physical security as well. And it should all be, be uh, part of your risk management structure. Anybody else like to comment? Well, I, I just like to comment that most of the uh, incidences that we've experienced or had were largely physical security issues, not so much cyber security issues. Okay, could we move on? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, uh, oh, oh, we're back there? Okay, excellent. Okay, go ahead, sir. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ibrahim Hamad from Dolphin Energy in Abu Dhabi. Uh, my question is, is related to the, the effort we exert in implementing as operators uh, frameworks, cybersecurity hardening, all the requirements that set by standards. But when we go to the protect level, we find usually the issue is, comes from the vendor. For, for instance, how many of us have deployed antivirus but still have exclusion directories that cannot be scanned? Some of us cannot put host intrusion detection. Some of us can implement network and traffic shaping and packet capture, but they cannot put it on the industrial network. So how far are the vendors getting more committed or getting higher maturity towards implementing security controls at the protect level? And how the DH organizations like the DHS or govern uh, governments enforcing vendors to provide this beyond marketing slides? Or in other words, to be a capability rather than being just a module we have to purchase or invest in, uh, invest in it to, to have a cyber security. Thank you. Did, did you get the question? <laughs> I, I can start. Uh, I'm not a vendor of, uh, of them, but uh, let me address the, uh, uh, the DHS portion. Because we do do, we do do a lot of work with the, uh, the vendors. Um, first of all, you know, for those, uh, for those uh, companies that we deal with that um, don't have the capability of uh, producing such controls based upon the infrastructure they've already invested in, we always make the recommendation is to uh, make sure that your systems, if they uh, are at a level where you believe the risk is high enough, disconnect them from the internet. And, use other mechanisms of controlling your critical industrial control systems. We think that that's fair and prudent and it's the best practice. And, and frankly, having your industrial control systems for your critical infrastructure connected to the internet poses great risk and should not be taken lightly. Now, I'm working with a lot of the vendors and I would def defer to my colleagues here. You know, I, I am aware of uh, a lot of investigative uh, work into retrofitting some devices to uh, produce better capabilities as well as the production of some new capabilities to do some of the things as you said. Mm -hmm. Peter? Uh, okay.